Hello, and welcome to another in the series of conversations uh, in the antitrust section's uh, oral history project. My name is John Shenefield, and I'm pleased to welcome Kaz Hobbs here today. Kaz, welcome. Thank you, John. Now, I should tell the viewers that Kaz and I are not exactly strangers. Uh, we were law partners for almost 20 years and good friends and tennis buddies for far longer than that. So I just simply want to put that put this conversation in that context. Kaz, you're here because you had an eminent career as an antitrust lawyer. Indeed, I would say a triple threat mm. antitrust lawyer, government enforcement, private practice, and then the bar as well. So I guess the, as we think about the audience being comprised of, among others, young lawyers, the question is, why law? Well, you make choices as you go along, uh, forks in the road, as they have said. And um, I started out wanting to be a forest ranger. Um, that, that evolved into a geologist. Uh, when I went to college, I was a, a business administration uh, major. And uh, by the time my senior year came around, I decided that was too narrow. Um, there was a career choice there to go shoot at people and be shot at. And I decided that was not what I wanted to do. And uh, so at that point, uh, law school became very attractive. I liked the notion of dealing with uh, broad policy issues. Uh, I thought I could build on my business administration uh, experience, and uh, that's how the decision was made. So you come out of law school in 1966, was it? There 1963. 63. Oh, law school, 66, yes. 66, and, and these are the reigning years of the Johnson administration and the end of the 60s. So why antitrust law? I had uh, started out with uh, labor in uh, mind. Uh, when I interviewed the uh, various labor agencies and uh, understood what they really did, I said uh, that really was not what I wanted to do. Uh, and, um, and someone suggested the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, I, liked the, uh, I liked the notion of antitrust and consumer protection in, in one agency. I always have. Uh, I could build and utilize my, uh, my um, uh, business administration background there. And uh, most importantly, they seemed interested in hiring me. <laughs> so what, I mean, just standing on, on the threshold of a career, you, you look at government as a possibility, private practice as a possibility. What were the options that were running through your mind and what seemed attractive to you? I, at that point, I was pretty clear that I was destined for a government public service career. Um, I really wasn't interested in private practice or, or the private sector. Um, and. Uh, and my first several years at the Federal Trade Commission really uh, confirmed that bias, that I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I was uh, at the point of almost planning to make that a career. So what, what was your entry-level position? How, does that, how did that go? I was um, a, a GS-7, uh, I believe, honors program, and a, um, an attorney advisor in what was then the Falls Church Regional Office. My goodness. And do we, we had, still have a Falls Church Regional uh, Office? We do not. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> and so you then came downtown, presumably at some point. I uh, spent about a year there investigating cases, uh, developing cases, then went uh, uh, for another year to the general counsel's office, uh, writing uh, legal opinions, uh, uh, dealing with motions to quash subpoenas uh, and the like. Uh, went from there to the uh, Bureau of Co uh, Competition, where I was going to get my trial experience. And uh, then that got uh, interrupted with, by the uh, opportunity to go work for uh, the then new chairman, Miles Kirkpatrick. Not so fast. Let's, let's stop a little bit before then. I've always heard you described as somebody who had a hand in the Pfizer case. Uh, step back and say a little bit about the Pfizer case and what, what it meant for the law and what it meant for you. All right. Well, now, the Pfizer we'll take case it in, in, yep. in bits. actually arose uh, while I was in the, the chairman's office. I was his attorney oh. advisor. And, um, and it, was a, um, it was an advertising case that had been uh, 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 tried before an administrative law judge and then brought to the commission. And to that point in time, the FTC uh, had to prove an advertisement uh, to be either false or misleading. Uh, so if a claim was made that uh, product uh, X works twice as fast as the, all the competitive products, uh, the FTC had to uh, carry a burden of proof that would prove not only how fast product X worked, uh, but also how fast the competitive products worked, and, and then determine whether the twice as fast claim was uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, erroneous. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pfizer changed, uh, came up with a new legal standard that radically shifted the burden of proof. 
And um, in a nutshell, Pfizer now, uh, the Pfizer doctor now asks of an advertiser, uh, what basis did you have for making this, this uh, advertising claim? And under, under the Pfizer decision, if an advertiser does not possess a reasonable basis for the advertising claim, he has thereby violated uh, the Federal Trade Commission Act. Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. the inquiry is, is very different, uh, and the, the burden on the, uh, on the commission is, was mm -hmm. very different. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. So I think uh, thereafter, the, uh, the Pfizer doctrine and, uh, and related cases became the, uh, the, the primary th thrust uh, for uh, mm -hmm. investigation of uh, uh, false advertising. And this precedent lives on? It's still it, vital? It lives on. I take it it doesn't apply to political campaigns? Uh, clearly not. Clearly not. Now, what was your, what was your role in the Pfizer matter? Well, I, I, I provided an initial draft of the, uh, the opinion to Miles, and, uh, and then Miles Kirkpatrick, as uh, the commissioner and the chairman, uh, worked his magic on it, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it came out as a, an opinion of the commission. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I've heard you discussed in connection with was the, the powers of the commission. Uh, what, what did the commission actually have the power to do? Um, and and the, whole, the whole issue of the Flammable Fabric Act powers, say, say a word about that. that Set the stage. That was one of the most fun parts of uh, my growing up experience in the FTC. Mm -hmm. um, you were uh, here still in the... I was then in the general counsel's office. Got it. And, uh, and uh, Phil Ellman, who was then a commissioner, had uh, seen a, uh, a note in the Harvard Law Review that suggested that the uh, FTC possessed uh, certain powers under the Flammable Fabrics Act. Mm -hmm. And so he sent a one-line request to the, uh, to the general counsel, which ended up on my desk, uh, asking, is it true that we, the FTC has these powers in enforcing the act? Well, the quick answer to that was, um, was, was no, it was not true. <laughs> yeah. um, but that uh, really, we, we decided that, uh, that, uh, that the larger question Phil meant to ask was how can we become more effective in, uh, in enforcing the Flammable Fabrics Act? Now, was this your interpretation or was well, it? Yes, yes. Was uh, it informed by anything? Or? Uh, no, no. We, we decided <laughs> that, that Phil would be pleased if we <laughs> chose to answer that right. question as well. Yeah. And so my, my colleague and, and conspirator in this was Tim Waters. And uh, Tim and I worked up uh, what ultimately became uh, known as the Flammable Fabrics ba uh, Battle Plan. And it was a document about an inch long that, uh, that, that, that went through about 20 different things that the FTC could do to become far more effective in enforcing the uh, Flammable Fabrics Act. And, um, and, and so we, as I say, we, we, we answered no to, uh, to the, the, the question they asked, and, uh, but yes to uh, the question implied. And, and if if those powers in fact existed, uh, are there examples of where the enhanced powers have been used or applied? Uh, uh, yes, there was an era there uh, that um, uh, where the Flammable Fabrics Act was used aggressively against the carpet industry. Flammable carpet was a, mm -hmm. a major concern. Uh, Cap Weinberger had then come in as the uh, new chairman of the Federal Trade Commission and for reasons I've never quite understood, seized upon the, uh, the Flammable Fabrics <laughs> Act as, as uh, his uh, leading thrust in, uh, in rejuvenating the FTC's consumer protection work. Uh, so CAP would routine, routinely appear on television holding up burning items and <laughs> uh, insisting he would uh, go after them. But uh, what came to be known as the FTC's uh, march through Georgia, uh, where all the carpet manufacturing is oh. located, uh, was pursuant <coughs> to the enforcement of the Flammable Fabrics Act. Yes, we, we started seizing product under, under our authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act, not the Flammable Fabrics Act, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, seeking injunctions, uh, seeking real relief at the outset, and, uh, and it was very effective. Mm -hmm. I have to say, uh, it's escaped me that the Flammable Fabrics Act was much of a part of your private practice experience. Uh, you know, actually, uh, Miles and I had a Flammable Fabrics Act um, um, uh, a case uh, <laughs> early on out of the New York office, and, uh, and they were asking our client to sign a consent order where he, would have, uh, where he was obligated to keep obtaining new bonds on the shipment of product in a way that was just mathematically impossible to do. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and it took Miles and I uh, six months to uh, wrestle the New York <laughs> Regional Office to the ground, but we, we finally came up with an answer. So this, this, was a, this was something you did while in a general counsel's office, and lo and behold, the next thing you know, you're in the chairman's office. Was there a connection between those two things? 
uh, uh, there, there was. Um, the, um, uh, uh, when Miles arrived, he had uh, some uh, attorney advisors and uh, an executive director uh, already in place from Caps Day. Uh, and both of them, ha uh, when Miles asked who would be uh, potential candidates for attorney advisor, uh, recalled my involvement with that Flammable Fabrics mm -hmm. uh, battle plan memorandum and put my name on Miles' list. So uh, that's how I got to an interview. Now, Miles Kirkpatrick is one of the big names of the Federal Trade Commission's history. Say a word about him and how he got there and with what expectation he was awaited. Uh, well, there, there's sort of two parts to that answer. One, mm -hmm. my own personal opinion, shared by almost everyone that knew him, is, was that Miles was one of the most uh, unique lawyers that, uh, that we've ever encountered. Mm -hmm. uh, he was um, uh, gentlemanly is the word that's customarily the first word out of someone's mouth, but he was, he was a brilliant lawyer. Mm -hmm. He was a superb analyst. Uh, he was a very unassuming uh, gentleman, uh, and um, and he was a, a broad gauged uh, 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 person. He uh, uh, he enjoyed uh, speaking French. He uh, he almost was a concert pianist one time in mm -hmm. his life, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but he was just a delightful person to be with. Mm -hmm. Miles, uh, before he came to the commission, had uh, been in uh, Philadelphia most of his professional career with Morgan Lewis, and um, and had uh, uh, been active in the ABA had become chairman of the ABA, and uh, in that capacity was asked by Pre President Nixon, uh, following the, uh, the issuance of the Nader Report, which uh, was, a, was a scathing review of the FTC, uh, President Nixon was not about to um, act on the basis of a Nader Report, so he asked the ABA to investigate, mm -hmm. and Miles headed up the uh, commission that investigated the Federal Trade Commission which essentially confirmed the major points that the uh, NATO report had made uh, just in much more polite uh, language. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as a consequence of that, when, uh, when uh, uh, President Nixon asked Cap Weinberger to move over to OMB, uh, he called Miles and uh, invited Miles to, uh, to become chairman of the Federal Trade Commission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the little vignette that goes with that is that uh, Miles was in the shower at the time and his wife Ann comes and says, Miles, Miles, dear, uh, you have a phone call uh, from the president. And, uh, and Miles uh, says, thinking she's joking, which she frequently did, said, well, would you please tell him I'll call him back when I get out of the shower. Uh, thank goodness Anne persisted, and Miles took the call and, uh, and said yes. <laughs> um, and did Miles, Miles, your name had obviously come to his attention. Um, how, did you, how did he enlist you in, in his office's uh, staff. Uh, we had a. I had an interview. I don't know how many others had interviews, mm -hmm. but I, I knew of several, and uh, and so I, I met Miles for the first time in in the Grand Chairman's office, and mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, talked for about two hours about the case that I was then mm -hmm. working on, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, at the end of that was the end of it. And, uh, and did you know you had the job when you? I did not, um, and <laughs> uh, and in fact uh, he gave me a pretty good scare. I had spent two hours describing the uh, shopping center case that I was working on, and and went into great length on the uh, the legal theories I was developing and uh, and as he was escorting me out of the office he uh, said oh that's that's fascinating Kaz the the last opinion that I gave before I uh, left private practice was to one of our clients <laughs> that asked me that very question and then he closed the door without ever telling me what advice he gave did you ever find out I never did I never did how did you find out that you'd been given that job because it's quite a plum position it was a plum it it, it Probably took about ten days before I got the call, but I got the call mm -hmm. from Miles and uh, and uh, accepted immediately. What was he like to work with? Oh, he 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 was a delight. He mm -hmm. was a delight. Again, he was he was um, uh, with all of that experience and uh, and uh, that wonderful background. He was like working with a peer. He. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in later years, I, I realized that that's what they meant by the term mentor. I didn't realize then I was being mentored, but uh, mm -hmm. I came to appreciate it later uh, uh, greatly. And it didn't hurt that he was an avid tennis player. Uh, it did not. It did not. We, <laughs> we, we shared that in common. And you presumably spent time on the court together at some point. Uh, we did. We, uh, we, we had uh, some very good tennis, uh, also some very bad tennis, but uh, <laughs> uh, Bob Batofsky and Alan Ward played as well, and, uh, and so... Uh, we had uh, had a lot of good tennis. Uh, one of my one of my favorite stories. I don't know whether I've ever told you this one was uh, Miles um, um, uh, and I worked one Saturday and uh, and it was Saturday morning and we'd arranged we were going to play tennis that afternoon. And Miles came in wearing uh, uh, slacks and a 
sport coat and, um, and a sweater and a striped shirt and a bow tie, <laughs> and um, as it was his custom on Saturdays. Mm. And, uh, and then uh, we retired to, to my house for, for him to go upstairs and change. And, uh, and he came down wearing um, his tennis shoes and his slacks and his sport coat and his sweater <laughs> and his bow tie. And we proceeded to play tennis that way. And uh, we played on my courts behind my house, our, our neighborhood uh, swim club, and, and, uh, and uh, cut off jeans and uh, tie dyed shirts were sort of the fashion note of the day. So, of course, all of my tennis buddies from the club were down there. They were astonished, but uh, it, Ma Miles was unflappable. Yeah, he retained his aplomb. Um, I know, I know Miles, uh, I think of him as having restored a certain amount of um, sense of legitimacy and integrity and credibility to the commission. Do you, is that, is that a way of thinking of him? And oh, absolutely, absolutely. How uh, did he do that? Um, Miles f first uh, uh, had his own reputation, mm -hmm. he, um, uh, which was uh, considerable in the antitrust field. Uh, he was probably the first of that kind to come down and share an agency like the mm -hmm. uh, Federal Trade Commission. Mm -hmm. He surrounded himself with very talented people, Bob Potofsky and Alan Ward. Mm -hmm. um, and then he uh, chose his first five cases uh, very wisely, mm -hmm. uh, prosecuted them aggressively, and within six months, um, not only had the private bar come to understand that, that there was a, a, a new marshal in town, mm -hmm. but, um, but Miles had attracted considerable press attention. And, um, and Miles, Miles was just a natural with the press. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the early headlines uh, said uh, in the Washington Post in one of the editorials was, uh, a compulsive truth teller is loose. <laughs> uh, but he enjoyed a, a wonderful relationship with the press. He went yeah. on to enjoy a wonderful relationship on the Hill with the likes of Jamie Whitten and, uh, and uh, ah. others. Uh, so uh, um, uh, it was it was in large part due to Miles, but uh, within a year the agency was drawing rave reviews. Mm -hmm. It had been turned around. All of the press was very favorable, and it was having a, a significant impact on its enforcement credibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does the the Federal Trade Commission is its budget is reviewed by OMB, presumably? Uh, it is. D did it? Did it? Nevertheless, get money that it wasn't asking for, and how did Miles deal with that? That's always a tricky issue, as you know. Uh, uh, in those days, it was a tricky issue, and uh, and one of the uh, funnier occasions was when Miles went up. Uh, Jamie Whitten was chairman of the uh, appropriations committee, yes, and and two more different people you could uh, not imagine, <laughs> yeah. uh, but nonetheless, Miles uh, had wor uh, worked uh, into a wonderful working relationship with Chairman Whitten, and uh, so at an appropriations. Uh, uh, a committee meeting, uh, Miles testified and asked for uh, his budget, and, uh, and, uh, and Jamie Whitten said, uh, Mr. Chairman, you're going to get what you asked for, and because the commission has been doing such a good job, we're going to give you an extra million dollars. Goodness. And he said, what do you think of that? And Miles thought quietly, he said, uh, Mr. Whitten, I appreciate that, but um, we've presented a budget that we think is uh, more than adequate to do the job that, uh, that we, uh, we think needs to be done. I'm not sure we could spend in another million dollars wisely. Uh, I'd be content with just what we've asked for. And uh, Jamie Whitten was a bit taken back by that <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. decided uh, uh, his next statement was, well, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that, but I am going to give you another million dollars, <laughs> and I don't want you coming back next year and telling me you did not spend that million dollars. <laughs> and Miles accepted that it was his charge. Now, you were at the FTC roughly, roughly how long? Uh, five and a half years. Thinking, thinking back about it with some perspective of distance, um, was, that a, was that a good time for you? Were you did you like that experience, no. fulfilled uh, by it? Very much so. I, at at uh, year five, I was persuaded that was going to be my, be my mm -hmm. career. I thoroughly mm -hmm. enjoyed the FTC. I, mm -hmm. thoroughly, I, I believed in what it was doing. And, um, and uh, I thought that's where I would spend the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. We have lots of young lawyers that will be viewing this. What do you say to young lawyers these days? Do you recommend uh, government service at some point? Absolutely. I, I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful experience in, in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, I think it prepares you uh, uh, wonderfully for private practice. Uh, it gives you a, a level of responsibility that's very difficult to achieve in private practice. Mm -hmm at any age and stage, but much less than, than a young age and stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and you meet a, uh, a wonderful group of people. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I highly recommend it. And, and the people that you remember from those years, do you, are you still in touch with them? 
Well, I've mentioned uh, Alan Ward and Bob yeah. Dosky, who are two of my heroes, but uh, I was thrown in with a group of, of peers that, uh, that, uh, whose names you'll recognize. Uh, Tim Waters, I mentioned, mm -hmm. but uh, Nancy Buck, Jody Bernstein was mm -hmm. one, Chris mm -hmm. White, who's still at the Federal Trade Commission, mm -hmm. Bob Scatole. It, it was... Uh, That's quite you know, a roster, isn't it? it, it, it uh, yeah. uh, Camelot was a, was a, a <laughs> word thrown around in those days, uh, uh, and we felt that way. Do you think government service is different today in some fundamental way? Oh, I think it is. I think uh, one of the things that I valued uh, was the ability to move from position to position to position right. and ex have a variety of experiences. I think that's much more difficult today, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and and I, and I th I think that's too bad. I mm -hmm. I, I, um, um, I think it's uh, uh, well enough said. You you received and I can't remember when maybe 2004 or so the FTC Lifetime Achievement Award. I did. What what does that stand for, and who who makes that a choice? Uh, well, uh, it's my understanding that the choice is made by the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission in consultation with the commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, Deborah Majoris was the chairman then. My, I've always believed that my name was uh, passed on to her by Tim Muris. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and it's uh, named in, in, in honor of Miles Kirkpatrick. Uh, and it, um, it is to recognize individuals that, uh, who have made uh, contributions uh, both uh, in the private and public sectors uh, to the well-being of the Federal Trade Commission. Mm -hmm. well, that's, you ought to be proud of that. I, I was delighted. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, it's said that you were the founder of a clandestine organization that meets in secret and has restrictive membership rules. Uh, can you say a word about that? That's how we've always characterized it to uh, antitrust division <laughs> lawyers. Uh, and, uh, the Castro C. Gear Society uh, started out as Castro a, C. Gear. Castro C. Gear. Who is he? Or what, what is well, it? Well, uh, Castro was a made-up name. Castro C. Gear, a remarkably similar name, was um, uh, was a judge in Tennessee, uh, who was um, uh, was then head of the Oak Ridge, Tennessee field station, <laughs> and um, and reputed to be part of uh, the uh, Paul Rand Dixon's uh, Tennessee gang that mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. ran the FTC. He, he came to public note when the uh, Nader's Raiders, uh, trying to find out what the mission of the Oak Ridge, Tennessee field station might be, uh, called the office every day for six months and no one ever answered the telephone. Uh, so um, we decided that was an appropriate uh, a name for our alumni society. And what does this organization do? It meets once a year. Uh, it used to be for a Christmas party. It's now for a holiday party. Uh, I think the uh, the first uh, meeting of the society consisted of about six of us: uh, Bob and Alan, Miles, Tim, Jody, Nancy. Mm -hmm. uh, it has since grown to um, and uh, to something the numbers in the hundreds and has its own rules and rituals. <laughs> um, I, I knew it was. We don't need to inquire into those. Uh, too carefully. I, I knew it was outgrowing uh, the original founders when. When one day when uh, I got a phone call from an, an angry commissioner's office saying that uh, a certain attorney advisor had not been uh, invited to the <laughs> Castro C. Gear party, and, and did I know that it was the tradition that those attorney advisors were <laughs> always invited. Right. So. right. Well, you know, it, it causes one to reflect on this, this notion of dual enforcement, Federal Trade Commission, Department of Justice, which at the very least is confusing and at the worst is downright inefficient question I've asked you many times in the past, looking for a good answer, why not just abolish the FTC? Mm. I've always thought we should abolish the antitrust division and uh, <laughs> retain the FTC. The FTC has the advantage of a lot of flexibility in its administrative powers, uh, was created to have superior expertise, um, and uh, th that may not have actually been realized. Uh, but I think the, the combination of the uh, antitrust authority and the consumer protection authority is in fact a very important combination. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would I would hate to see the um, the uh, the antitrust authority be divested from the consumer protection authority. You would not want to do away with the consumer protection authority. You might mm -hmm. even end up with a super consumer protection agency if you went down that mm -hmm. road, uh, mm -hmm. combining the uh, uh, the uh, CPSC, which was much discussed at, at one point. It, it was, and uh, to the horror of uh, of some people, and to the delight of others. Uh, <laughs> but I don't. Uh, I know you've always been perplexed by it, but I've always thought that was a bit of a pretense as well. But uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't think there's any great inefficiency there. Uh, if we were starting over again, we might not do it that way. But uh, but I think uh, that it's a it's a very useful institution. Strike the word might. <laughs> well, so all good things must come to an end. The FTC experience is a, is a good and fulfilling one. And now you turn your 
uh, talent toward private practice. Say a little bit about how that happened and what your thinking was. Well, there was a, there was a day that, uh, that Miles came to me and uh, said, uh, Kaz, I've decided um, that uh, I've done about all here that I can do uh, usefully, and I'm going to return to private practice uh, with my old uh, law firm, and I would uh, I'd like for you to think about coming with me. Mm. And uh, until that moment, uh, I was persuaded I was going to stay at the, uh, at the Federal Trade Commission mm. uh, for a career. And, um, and I told him that, uh, and he said, well, I understand that, and it would be a worthy career, uh, but in fairness to yourself, you really ought to give private practice a try. So I took that home and, and, um, and uh, uh, took it up with Ann, and, uh, Ann, Ann, who's been an uh, invaluable joint venture partner all the way through all of these decisions. Uh, we mm -hmm. decided he was right, and despite my uh, earlier vows that I would never have uh, anything to do with a Philadelphia law firm, that they were all, <laughs> all too stodgy and conservative for me, um, I agreed uh, to go practice with Miles. Mainly because it was Miles. We, we had such mm -hmm. a wonderful relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I understood early on that, that I would not be able to make any meaningful judgment about a, how desirable a law firm was from the outside. And so my sole proxy in that decision was I'll go wherever Miles is going, practice with him, mm -hmm. and then make a judgment mm -hmm. should I continue in mm -hmm. private practice. So you, you were installed in the, in the Washington office of this Philadelphia yes. law firm. Um, say a little bit about what kind of practice you were you found yourself involved in. Was it mostly FTC stuff? Well, Miles and I uh, arrived, and while there was uh, a few people in the firm that had done odds and ends of uh, antitrust and consumer protection, uh, we were really starting out the Washington kind of practice mm -hmm. uh, on our own. So for the first several weeks, we were very busy writing memos to each other. Uh, and uh, but then uh, uh, Congress established. <laughs> the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Mm. Uh, and since it was a brand new agency, there were no uh, practitioners practicing before the agency. So uh, the, the, the clients that needed representation uh, came to, uh, to Miles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Miles and I started out actually with a, uh, a Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, uh, matter that was kept us occupied for two or three years. Mm -hmm. Not full time, obviously, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. was our first major project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was a, it, Took six months to a year to really get our plates full, mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and uh, from mm -hmm. there on out, it's uh, it continuing to grow. And you were you were in private practice all all told almost thirty years, if almost I 30 years. do the math right. Was it was it sort of equal parts consumer protection and antitrust? Was it litigation? Was it mergers? What? How do you think of it? In the uh, in the early days, it was uh, probably equal parts consumer protection and and antitrust. Uh, it was um, it was not litigation, despite several attempts. I had never earned my litigation spurs, and at some point, in my you would career, have been a good one. I assure you. I, I like the idea, <laughs> but I just gave up even pretending to have expertise in that area. And uh, so my practice, all the way through my my practice, was uh, was a counseling practice. Mm -hmm. uh, after why did you like that? Why did you like counseling? Uh, uh, there's two parts to it, and, and one is, is probably why I'm not a lit wasn't a litigator. Uh, confrontation, uh, 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 the kind of, of give and take of litigation, is not the way I enjoy doing things. I right. I, I like to bring a problem solving approach to things. I like to think it through. I like to come up with a, an approach that I think is a win win, and 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 recognizes what the other side mm -hmm. is after and does as much as mm -hmm. we can. So that part of a counseling practice appealed to me a lot, and mm -hmm. and I think uh, that's uh, that's that's why I had good working relationships both with my clients and uh, with the people at the uh, uh, antitrust division mm -hmm. and the Federal Trade Commission that were on the other side of these mm -hmm. proceedings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it ultimately involved into uh, mostly an antitrust practice, mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, equal parts of a trade association practice on uh, uh, on one hand and a mergers and acquisitions mm -hmm. uh, practice on the other mm -hmm. hand uh, with mm -hmm. odds and ends of clients that would take you um, into strange forays into mm -hmm. uh, price mm -hmm. fixing or, uh, or things that looked like price fixing. Mm -hmm. say, say something about the importance of um, retaining your reputation for integrity in your dealings with government agencies. Because a lot of people, a lot of people wonder why uh, a practitioner that's been in a government agency is so terribly concerned about realizing about making sure the government agency understands that what he says is is true and can be taken to the bank and I know you you were highly regarded by the enforcement people uh, 
Say, say something about that, that's, the importance of that. It's tricky to, um, uh, uh, one, I have no doubt that that kind of credibility is enormously important uh, and enormously useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I know that there were some people that really didn't think it was important to trade on that at all, that they, they, they thought uh, more just a um, straightforward, aggressive, uh, mm -hmm. a, a more combative approach was the right way to do things. I think uh, uh, solutions to problems came easier, uh, less expensively, um, and uh, more permanent lasting solutions when you worked in a cooperative manner with the government, mm -hmm. recognizing what their objectives were uh, and, and trying to meet their objectives in the way that uh, posed the least disruption on, on your client's business objectives as possible. And, Almost always, it was possible to find that that kind of middle ground. On the other hand, you have to you have to be careful that the client doesn't think that you're sacrificing its interests in order to maintain a good relationship with the enforcement. People. And and you also worry about that yourself. You mm -hmm. you also um, and I would find it was a, sort of a useful mental exercise mm -hmm. to try to take myself outside of the box to station mm -hmm. myself in uh, in uh, California and say if I were practicing law in California. Mm -hmm. It, would I consider this a, a fair resolution of the situation? Mm -hmm. And um, and because there were many times I would worry about uh, buying into certain mm -hmm. assumptions uh, mm -hmm. too readily. Mm -hmm. So so I think it is a concern, and I mm -hmm. think clients are right to uh, to ask that question. Mm -hmm. I hope they uh, always answered it satisfactorily mm -hmm. in my case. Mm -hmm. I, I believe they did. But it, w one of the things that impressed me when I arrived at at Morgan Lewis was the extent to which you were also a major league manager. I mean, you, you ran the practice, you were involved in firm management. Um, what sort of reward did you find in that? Psychic income did you find in that? Well, we, uh, I go back, I think, to uh, my, my undergraduate business degree, uh, which mm -hmm. is a, a management uh, uh, kind of thinking. And, um, and I found that, uh, that uh, I not only enjoyed it, but I think I was good at it, at both at the uh, Federal Trade Commission and in private mm -hmm. practice. Uh, it, it first uh, came to me by default um, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, we started our antitrust practice. It was clear that Miles was not going to be the manager, so uh, <laughs> I took it on. As it, as it grew, I, I gained in uh, management experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Bill Curtin uh, then decided I was uh, ready for the uh, uh, management committee mm -hmm. in the Washington office. It mm -hmm. just grew over time, mm -hmm. but, but I thoroughly enjoyed it and, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, liked to think that I had some impact. Did you, did you, in the same way that you felt about the Federal Trade Commission, did you, did you also enjoy private practice? Did you sort of look forward to coming to the office each day? Uh, I, I did. I did. Uh, I had promised myself after practicing mile, with Miles for three years I would then take a step back and evaluate where I wanted to really practice law, maybe mm -hmm. go back to the government. Um, but, um, but at that point, I, I, I had come to uh, thoroughly um, uh, enjoy and, and uh, uh, the practice at Morgan Lewis. I had mm -hmm. many good friends at Morgan mm -hmm. Lewis. I had two or three more mentors at Morgan Lewis in addition to Miles. Mm -hmm. and, and then at that point, the thought of not practicing with, Mi with Miles was just unthinkable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, I came. I, I uh, disavowed my earlier bias against the uh, Philadelphia law firms, <laughs> uh, made many good friends in the Philadelphia office, mm -hmm. and, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, came to value Morgan Lewis mm -hmm. as an institution uh, as much as I did the FTC. You, you saw law practice change mm -hmm. in th 30 years of practice in those years. See what was a time of, of real change for the, the way law is practiced and law firms are run. What, what do you think about that? Is it for the better, for the worse? Oh, I think law firms are far more efficient and effective today in uh, the legal services that mm -hmm. they deliver to their clients. Um, I think that comes um, at a sacrifice to a, a lifestyle that, that I valued uh, uh, considerably. I think you did as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we didn't have the billable hour pressures uh, uh, then that we had today. That allowed for a, uh, a, a much more considerable participation in organizations like the ABA, I was active in the Legal Aid Society, mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, and, and I think today, while the law is still very satisfying, the challenge to lead a, a balanced life uh, where you're not consumed by your law practice mm -hmm. is much more difficult, so I liked my practice. You, I mean, one of the things that always impressed me about you was your interest in legal aid. Um, I mean, you were, you were a vigorously practicing lawyer, you were in management, you were would come to the the bar association. Then you had were involved in leadership role in legal aid. Um, how did that happen, and what did it mean to you? 
Well, it, uh, 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 it it was just one of those connections. A good friend was active in legal aid mm -hmm. and uh, said that uh, that I should um, I should give it a try, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, uh, I did a little bit of work with them, and uh, then uh, was invited to go on to the board. Spent mm -hmm. several years on the board, mm -hmm. enjoyed that, and ended up a couple of years as as president. Mm -hmm. it, uh, uh, again, it's a an institution that gave me a, a new exposure uh, mm -hmm. uh, to um, uh, matters that I guess could largely be called consumer protection matters, but but with a very different edge mm -hmm. than they mm -hmm. had at the FTC. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed it considerably, and mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, at one point was thinking when I retired I might go on to the desk at the Legal Aid Society. No, oh, really? Uh, I, Interesting. Now the 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 triple threat, the the third part of the of the third leg of the stool that we haven't talked about yet is the Bar Association. Uh, and the antitrust section in particular. What 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 attracted you to it, and why did you devote so much time to it, and what do you count for? What what accounts for your enormous success in it? Well, uh, let me take you back to the beginnings. The uh, the first time I really became a, aware of the uh, of the uh, ABA antitrust section was uh, when I was in the Falls Church regional office, mm -hmm. and someone said, "Are you going to the spring meeting?" And I had no idea <laughs> what the spring meeting was, but it sounded like a good thing to be doing, so I said yes. And, uh, and found myself in a car and uh, at the spring meeting. Come into the ballroom at the Shoreham Hotel, and here is um, a panel up there, and the one fellow I remember was uh, Ira Milstein. Right. And I listened to Ira for about 20 minutes, and I, I don't even recall the subject. But I was just blown away by the, the level of discourse, uh, the, the, the balanced approach to difficult public policy issues, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I was hooked right then. Mm -hmm. uh, stayed a bit involved. It's difficult to be involved when you're in the government. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I uh, joined Morgan Lewis, uh, within a few weeks or months, I received a call from Irv Shear mm -hmm. uh, inviting me to become active in the uh, Federal Trade Commission Committee. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, went to Miles at that point and said, Miles, the, uh, they're asking me to put some time in on the ABA. What do you think? And I will never forget his answer. Miles said, uh, Kaz, you will... Uh, you will never have a more professionally satisfying experience in your life than you will in the ABA, mm -hmm. and you will never meet a more satisfying group of friends than you will meet there as well. By all means, do it. And he and had it was, done it himself. He had done it. He was a former chair. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. So uh, 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 with that endorsement, mm -hmm. uh, I mm -hmm. started out as a uh, subcommittee chair and uh, then just sort mm -hmm. of worked my way through the various mm -hmm. positions. Mm -hmm. Do you think the antitrust section has a useful role to play in these policy debates other than simply laying out what the issues are? What about the advocacy role? Well, I think the, um, uh, I think it, the ABA has an enormously useful and important role in that. I think it is a, a buffering agent mm -hmm. uh, between the, the business community on the one hand and frequently Congress on the other hand. Mm -hmm. um, I think the expertise and experience that the, uh, that the uh, ABA antitrust section brings to uh, policies in these areas, enforcement mm -hmm. procedures mm -hmm. in these areas is, is considerable and, mm -hmm. and I think uh, very valuable. And so mm -hmm. um, uh, I think and I, I, one of the great pleasures I took out of the ABA mm -hmm. was being able to keep my hand in these policy mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. um, uh, in a, uh, through the ABA in a way that your private practice clients just don't let you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you became chairman in due course, uh, which is sort of the pinnacle, I guess, uh, in the antitru of any section in the ABA. And next to winning the uh, tennis tournament, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I assume you won the tennis tournaments as well. Uh, what, what do you say of your time as chairman? What do you, what do you think of your, as your achievements? And the, um, uh, uh, I think uh, what I like to uh, reflect on is the amount of, uh, of sort of management uh, discipline and organization that I've tried to bring to bear on it. The, uh, the ABA antitrust section uh, grew over the years like Topsy. Uh, it had a lot of moving parts, mm -hmm. and um, and and uh, and I think we 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 by by bringing some management focus to it, mm -hmm. we we not only developed a a long term strategy that had been in need of updating, but mm -hmm. uh, but we uh, rationalized the uh, various components mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. that uh, that I think it became a more effective uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, body. Mm -hmm. The ABA is sometimes criticized as being um, sort of a repository of defense, you know, big corporate. Uh, lawyers, um, is that true of the antitrust section, or is it more is it more open than that? Does it have folks, for instance, from inside the clients themselves, inside lawyers, government people? Do they participate? They do participate. I, I, I think the the numbers do suggest that uh, mostly uh, uh, private firm, defense oriented people uh, 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 participate. 
But the uh, the ABA antitrust section, ever since I've been involved, has mm -hmm. been uh, been very open and made uh, great efforts to involve government mm -hmm. people, private plaintiff uh, uh, lawyers, uh, and uh, and others from state government, mm -hmm. with with varying degrees of success. But I think each mm -hmm. year uh, that you look at it, you say it's more and more successful in that mm -hmm. regard. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, I think for for the time I've been involved. It has been able to bring a balanced view mm -hmm. uh, to the um, uh, to whatever proposition it's considering, mm -hmm. regardless of the numbers of uh, people involved. Mm -hmm. I certainly certainly would agree. Uh, in recent years, with the Antitrust Modernization Commission, the antitrust section's contribution to that, and you may have had a hand in it, for all I know, was excellent. I mean, it's first-rate work, first-rate work, and very helpful indeed. Um, Looking back on the ABA chapter, then, other than being a terrific organizer of tennis tournaments, mm -hmm. what 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 do you take away from that? Do you advise young lawyers to join the antitrust section? Oh, I uh, again on on both of the grounds that Miles uh, mm -hmm. uh, endorsed it to me, uh, uh, the uh, the professional the the exposure that you get to issues mm -hmm. that your your private clients won't ever get you into mm -hmm. is is invaluable. It makes invaluable. It makes you a much broader. Um, a better lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, second, the friendships you make will mm -hmm. be truly unique. You, mm -hmm. you can make good friends in law firms, but you always have the uh, the overhang of a law firm relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the friends you make in the ABA, um, like you, like Harry Reasoner, like Les Jacobs, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, you have common backgrounds, common interests, but you your your friendships form in a way that's that's different than they do within mm -hmm. a law firm. I mm -hmm. found it invaluable. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of reaching out, projecting your your yourself and your influence on the one hand, but also taking an enormous uh, amount of information and views and whatnot from people all across the country and now indeed the world. Yeah. I've, I've, I find it it's like on the one hand playing a Wurlitzer organ and on another hand like listening to shortwave radio. Things come in from everywhere on every subject all the time. I will stipulate for that. <laughs> <laughs> so you so you. You have this wonderful career enforcement, you have private practice, you have the Bar Association, you have legal aid, uh, and then comes retirement. Um, what's that like? Um, I, I retired uh, uh, in order to um, uh, start pursuing some of those interests that had been on the shelf in, in whole or in part uh, during the time I was practicing. Ann and I wanted to get uh, a lot more travel in before uh, before our knees gave out on us, <laughs> um, and uh, there are a variety of other pursuits that uh, that I wanted to uh, to to pursue. I found, uh, to my utter surprise and great delight, uh, that that retirement is like unlike any other stage of your life whatsoever. It is literally the first time in your life that you can do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it, uh, for how, however long you want to do it. <laughs> And, um, and if you get up that morning having thought that you might take a hike and decide that you want to finish that, uh, the book, and you can spend all day doing mm -hmm. it. It is, mm -hmm. it is a delightful feeling of freedom. You, mm -hmm. you, you gradually give pieces of that away, mm -hmm. but it's a, it, it is a, a unique sensation that, uh, that I, I relish. So what have you found yourself doing on an average day? How do you spend that, all that time, all that free time? I, I've made considerable inroads to the pile of books that uh, grew over the years I was practicing law mm -hmm. rather than diminished. Um, I still enjoy uh, tennis, uh, mm -hmm. my hiking, my uh, uh, fly fishing. I've uh, gotten involved in uh, several uh, Alexandria um, community organizations that, mm -hmm. uh, that probably take up more time today than I mm -hmm. had anticipated they would. Um, and we still are doing our travel, although that, um, that lately, with the with the birth of two uh, grandchildren, has become more uh, uh, centric uh, to uh, the places where those grandchildren mm -hmm. are located. Mm -hmm. uh, For people like me who like to go to London and Paris, you go to sort of exotic places, Kilimanjaro and mm -hmm. Machu Picchu, and why do you do that? What's the point of that? Well, I, I think it all stems from uh, that, those days that uh, I aspired to be a forest ranger. <laughs> uh, but I've, uh, I've, I've always enjoyed the outdoors. Uh, I've always done a lot of hiking. And, um, and, and, and in fact, uh, at, there came that point in, in my law practice where I, I thought, I'm not doing enough of that. And, uh, and so uh, it was an act of real deliberation that I said, I'm, each year I'm going to do something. 
fortunately, our youngest daughter was still at home and uh, available to uh, uh, participate with me in, uh, right. in those adventures. This uh, is Emily. This is Emily. Uh, yeah. Anne was not so inclined, and, and <laughs> Beth was... Uh, Sensible and, woman. <laughs> yeah, Beth was in her college days. And so uh, Emily and I started with a, uh, a trip down the uh, Grand Canyon uh, uh, on mm -hmm. the uh, Colorado River, a raft mm -hmm. trip. Uh, mm -hmm. We proceeded to a raft trip in uh, the wilds of Alaska, uh, hiked, biked, and uh, rafted in uh, Glacier National Park. And each adventure mm -hmm. sort of uh, led the way to the next. Uh, the, uh, the one that uh, uh, was uh, the most challenging was our climb up Kilimanjaro. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm pleased mm -hmm. to tell you that uh, Emily outhiked all of the men on that uh, that <laughs> trip, and uh, and uh, I think it was a good experience for her as well. Uh, it's a, quite a climb, isn't it? How it, tall? How high is it? Uh, Nineteen three, I think, is the official. You climbed camera. the whole way. Climbed the whole way. Climbed the whole With way. With not a second breath, you just took it in stride. Uh, that's how I recall it now. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't hear any contrary testimony. And you're not under oath. <laughs> um, w w you've mentioned Anne. Uh, people who know you and know Anne think of her as a as an essential part of the co-captain of team hobbs um without getting too too much into it to say a little bit about how she has been a just such an enormous strength and compliment uh in in the way you've approached things and in your life i don't really know how to say it much better than that she has been an enormous strength and uh and compliment all the way through uh there was the two or three stages where a good friend suggested that, uh, that she was really the reason that I achieved certain <laughs> things that I did achieve, and yeah. uh, he, he may well have been I right. may well have been one of them. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do differently? What are your regrets? Well, n no regrets. Um, uh, I, I just wish I could have led three or four uh, different lives uh, concurrently. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the path not taken uh, it was very much in my mind. I would have I would have enjoyed being a forest ranger, and I, I've, I've often wondered what kind of person I would be today uh, uh, had I pursued that uh, that career. Uh, there was another time I was going to be a, a hunting fishing guide in Canada, and uh, and uh, so uh, all of those uh, all of those alternative lifestyles I still find very attractive. I've just never figured out how how I could re. Why redo is it, it you like to stand in water and try to attract the attention of a fish? The fish are always located in such beautiful places. That's there. true. And uh, That's true. and a, um, a you don't have anything to prevent you from contemplating the fish and its role in the universe and uh, and uh, what else might be there the next day. <laughs> Let me ask you a, a question that is a little bit out of the mainstream. If you if mainstream. you if you were uh, if you were recommending books to uh, to a young lawyer, um, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, whatever. What, what would be two or three things that you would like to pass on to this young lawyer by way of something that you've found valuable? And, and why, why are those particular items on your list? If we were to give this the uh, Desert Island uh, test, Let's try it. Um, I would uh, take the uh, collected works of uh, Mark Twain. I think that mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, I get more pleasure and more insight out of, uh, out of mm -hmm. any, any of his books than uh, uh, than. than most others I can name. Mm -hmm. If um, if I were taking some legal books, uh, the um, the series that uh, I think is uh, perhaps not as appreciated as it should be, are Jake Stein's books and articles, uh, mm -hmm. Legal Spectator series. Mm -hmm. I, I think those are those are brilliant and insightful and and well balanced. Mm -hmm. um, if you took my current uh, uh, reading list, uh, I've been on a uh, Wallace Stegner uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bent. Uh, Although um, uh, one book that always comes to mind was one of the first books that, uh, probably the first book I ever read through 20 times, and it was uh, essentially a travel book. It 20 was, uh, times, literally? Oh, so I'm, I'm sure that underestimates it. <laughs> but it was Richard Halliburton's Book of Marvels, a uh, favorite uncle gave it to me, and it was about all about Machu Picchu and Kilimanjaro and uh, Paris and Rome. And uh, it was a wonderful book that just opened your, your, your eyes to how many different places and different ways of life there were in the world, and uh, I think that's what gave me my wanderlust. It's, it, it is, it's a wonderful thing to sort of think about a book that's made a difference and try to pass it on to somebody else. You, you are well known for enjoying a glass of red wine on occasion. Suppose you thought of being a owner of a vineyard. Have you ever thought about that? No, not not owner of the vineyard. That's uh, that's too stationary. Too stationary. The, uh, the the life that that would fit 
would be uh, uh, running one of these uh, luxury barges on the uh, canals in France, <laughs> where um, uh, where you uh, partake of the local product and uh, and, uh, and and cruise uh, each day. Uh, that that I could do. That's a nice thought to leave us with the sort of notion of Kaz on the after deck of a barge floating through the Loire Valley of France, sipping some red wine. Kaz, we're out of time. It's been a privilege. I appreciate your being part of this history project and look forward to many more occasions. Thank you, John. I enjoyed the trip.